I'm going to call to order the July 19th work session of, or regular session of the Cabarrus County Board of Commissioners. At this time, I'd ask for everybody to stand for the presentation of colors by the Boy Scout Troop 3, First Presbyterian Church of Concord. Color guards advance. Color guards, prepare to post the colors. Color guards, post the colors. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This time I call on Pastor or Dr. Jonathan Castile from Lane Street Baptist <clears throat> Church for the invocation. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you tonight, Lord, and we thank you so much for the freedom and the ability to come and gather together here in this beautiful structure and this beautiful facility you've given us. Lord, we thank you for the freedom we have in our community and in our nation, Lord, and I ask you to bless the men and women here tonight as they have come together, Lord, to make decisions, Lord, regarding our community that we always remember and acknowledge the responsibility of the authority that we have, Lord, to make decisions in our community and how that may affect others. Lord, I ask you to be with all of us tonight, lead, guide, and direct everything that's said and done here today, that it will all be done in accordance to your will for the uplifting of your kingdom in heaven. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. The young men from Boy Scout Troop Number 3 could come forward and introduce themselves. And when you finish introducing yourselves, Commissioner Kruth will be on your right-hand side uh, to receive, to, for you, to give you a pen. You can speak into the microphone. That way we can hear you. My name is Tyler Watson, and I attended Harris Road Middle School. What grade are you in, Tyler? I'm now going to eighth. Thank you, sir. If you'll go over and see Commissioner Carruth. My name is Thomas Bennett, and I'm a sophomore at Northwest Cabarrus High School. Nice to see you. See you, Thomas. My name is Alex Jones, and I'm going into eighth grade at Harris Road Middle School. Thank you, Alex. I'm Casey Ablin. I'm going to seventh grade at Tamas. Thank you, Casey. My name is Matthew Abbott, and I'm going to seventh grade at Tamas. Thank you, Matthew. My name is Brennan Nesvogel, and I'm going to Canapolis Middle School. I'm going to seventh. I'm going into seventh grade. Thank you, Brennan. My name is Jake Crowder, and I'm I'm going to be in seventh grade at Northwest Middle School. Thank you, Jake. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming out tonight. We have, we have before us the approval or correction of the minutes that were presented to us. That's found on page four. This is for May the 27th, June the 7th, and June the 21st. Uh, Make a motion to be approved, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion, we have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion carries. Next matter we have is the approval of the agenda. The agenda is laid out before us. If there is no motions to amend, do we have a motion to accept the agenda as it is? So move. Second motion. We have a motion, we have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion carries. Next matter is uh, recognitions and presentations. At this point in time, I would ask Mrs. Farrington to come forward. Uh, this is on page 67 of our agenda packet. And this is, uh, the county has received a certificate of achievement for excellence in financial reporting. 
Um, I believe, if Mrs. Farrington will correct me, this is the 25th consecutive year that we received it. This is correct, 25 years. And it's, uh, it, uh, it's award-winning uh, recognition of all the accounting practices that we have and the audit report. Is that correct? This is correct, yes. Thank you. Commissioner. Yeah, we really do appreciate all the hard work. Um, you make it, staff members always make the commissioners look good. And um, we appreciate everything you've done and happy to give you the same. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate all the help from our department because it doesn't take one person. It takes everybody working together. How many so people in the department that are working on in any given day? Any given day, 11 people in our department. Some are part-time, some are full-time. But And that's through the budget all the way through the process? Budget through payroll, um, accounting, uh, purchasing. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You've done a great job. Thank you. next matter that we have is uh, informal public comments and this is a time where we take uh, public comments at a matter of three minutes and we would uh, we'd like when you call when your, your name is called if you'll please come up uh, state where you're uh, where you live and you will have your three minutes to speak so we can hear what you have to say first I have here is mrs. Jessica Juba <laughs> it's like, take, <laughs> like being called on when you take a bite to eat. There she goes. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. what how about, how, how, Mrs. Juba, Mrs. Juba, why don't you just take a seat? I'll call you in a second. That way you can, how about Sharon Blight? <laughs> Good evening, guys. My name is Sharon Blythe. I live at 2323 LRB Drive in Kannapolis, North Carolina. Um, I'm speaking today in support of the Justice for Bella reform of the Cabarrus County Animal Control. Until recently, Cabarrus County has hidden beho behind the fact that Jeff Daniels and his fiancee Jessica have withheld portions of the video taken the night Jessica or Bella was killed. They can no longer do that as it was released in full on Fox News. In the video, Deputy Austin refers to Bella as not just a dog, but a pit bull. To me, this shows how a large part of his decision to shoot was based on breed. As a professional dog trainer, I have worked with over 100 pit bulls and pit bull mixes. Um, I find them to be affectionate, intelligent, eager to please, and highly trainable. Would Bella have been shot if she was a cocker spaniel? Deputy Austin claims that he would have, been, have shot any animal that was an obvious threat to society. However, he also stated that Bella showed no acts of aggression toward him whatsoever. When asked why he simply did not give Bella a chance, Deputy Austin claimed that he did not have the time to sit there for three hours because he had other calls to make. Does this mean that Cabarrus County Animal Control is understaffed? And if so, does this mean that our pets are given time limits before being shot or killed? Another issue I would like to address is the use of tranquilizer guns as opposed to firearms. When Deputy Austin was questioned on why he did not tranquilize Bella instead of shooting her, he informed Mr. Daniels of the many dangers of such a device. When Deputy Austin, what Deputy Austin failed to inform Mr. Daniels of is that he was not authorized to use a tranquilizer gun. Um, nor was he ever trained to use one in the first place, even though he had been employed by Cabarrus C County Animal Control for approximately eight months. I would like to ask the council if it is true that there is only one person statewide who does all the training and that new officers have to wait long periods of time to get into these classes. How is this possible? Shouldn't our main concern not only be how efficiently they assess a situation, but also the safety of everyone involved? Is Cabarrus Animal Control aware that net guns are becoming increasingly popular for people in the animal capture industry? And they, um, and they do not require any special license or permit to operate. Would Bella be alive and well today if our animal control officers were properly trained and certified before they are put on duty? Do you not think they should have other options available, available to them besides lethal weapons? Finally, I would like to express how truly upsetting it was to hear after Bella was shot and removed from the scene that she was never scanned for a microchip, microchip, which she had, and her body was destroyed before Mr. Daniels could claim her. To me, this shows gross indifference and lack of compassion of animal control. 
Aren't animals caught or killed? Are, aren't animals caught or killed by animal control required to be scanned for a microchip? Do we not, as pet, as responsible pet parents, pay money to get our dogs microchipped for just a situation like this? Was Deputy Austin purposely neglecting this requirement because Bella was a pit bull, or was he not trained in this procedure either? I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Bella. Folks, I know there's a lot of people in here that, that are want to applaud, and we we are in a situation that we have a lot of things going on. I would ask uh, if we can just refrain until after you know we understand you're in support of Bella. Uh, that's why y'all come out, and quite a few people, quite a number of people. Anyway, at this point in time, I'll call on Mr. Daniels, if you'll, Mr. Jeff Daniels. Thank you. My name is Jeff Daniels. I'm at 2875. Eagle View Place here in Concord. I've uh, been here for uh, approximately uh, 10 years now. Uh, several weeks ago, we all witnessed a press conference that created more questions than it did to provide answers. To this day, rather than provide those answers or follow through with promises that were made, we've all heard excuses. First, it was a phantom lawsuit, then it was the video. Recently, we have also heard that animal control is not the problem. It is the Humane Society who cherry picks animals and rescue groups who won't work together. None of these excuses, however, have anything to do with the public shelter funded by our tax dollars and what the shelter is or isn't doing to prevent the killing of 80% of the animals they impound, over twice the national average. The problem is not the rescue groups. While they are a big part of the solution, it is not their responsibility to subsidize a public shelter and do their job for them. The problem is not the Humane Society. While they may be able to do better or do more, it is not their responsibility either. The cliches of irresponsible public or pet overpopulation, if you will, simply do not stand up under scrutiny. The number one indicator of the success or failure of a shelter is absolutely the commitment of the leadership to life-saving programs and services. If you are not implementing, uh, excuse me, if you are not implementing the proven cost-effective life-saving programs of the no-kill equation that have ended shelter killing in over 50 communities across the United States, including counties just like ours, how would you even know if there was a so-called pet overpopulation? How do we look at those numbers right now? If pet overpopulation or the irresponsible public, if you will, is the real problem in your opinion, then how is Reno, Nevada no kill, despite a shelter intake far greater than most places anywhere in this country? Why is the no kill working in rural communities, metropolitan communities, rich communities, poor communities, that spend much less per capita on animal control than we do here in Cabarrus County. <clears throat> this is the only system that has ended the killing of healthy, adoptable animals in shelters. Any other piecemeal solutions will not end the killing. Therefore, you will not be saving lines, saving lives, excuse me. Therefore, you cannot make a statement that you're on the side of saving animals. It takes proactive programs and services. Proactive programs and services, I might add, that save money both in the long run and in the short term. It is the, re the reactive policies that we have in place or lack of policies right now that are causing this problem and driving costs up. We are not solving any problems. We are not even defining it correctly. Without total reform, we will just continue to impound animals, round them up, and send them to a cruel and painful death in the gas chamber. Nothing will change. Shelter, in shelter intake will rise, the killing will rise, and the budget will rise. That is, until the community becomes aware or reaches a point where they've had enough. They see the failure, failure for what it is, a lack of compassion, and a lack of leadership. Well, that time is now. The residents, taxpayers, and voters of this county want change. We want change that should have been sought without having to resort to public outcry. 
We want leadership that looks for proactive solutions and looks for the best practices of, sh uh, of shelters across the country. We want the only change that has ever succeeded in ending shelter killing. That is the no-pill equation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daniels. Next is Mrs. Tracy Faircloth. Good evening. Uh, Tracy Faircloth, I live at 4987 Hallfield Street, Kannapolis. Um, another concern that needs attention, we believe, is the use of the gas chamber in the Cabarrus County Animal Shelter. It has been brought to our attention that some members of the council believe the gas chamber are a simple solution to a complex issue and that there is no way to entirely eliminate their use. If that is so, then why do nine states currently have laws specifically banning all forms of gassing in animal shelters? 75% of North Carolina's counties have similar restrictions. The solution is simple. Instead of placing frightened animals in dark, hot boxes where they suffocate for 30 minutes or longer, euthanize them by lethal injection. Lethal injection is far more humane, safer for workers, and more cost-effective than the gas chamber. When animals die by lethal injection, it takes two to five minutes. However, when animals are placed in the gas chamber, it can take 30 minutes or more before the animals actually die. Clearly, these animals are suffering. Haven't they suffered enough? Gas chambers must consistently be checked for cracks because carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless gas that is highly explosive. In 2009, gas buildup caused the door of the Lincoln County shelter to explode. The incident put an animal control officer in the emergency room. There have been no reports of accidental lethal injection. Not only do gas chambers cost lives, but they cost money as well. Studies made from data collected from an animal sheltering organization in North Carolina showed that the cost to use gas chamber is $4.66 per animal, while the cost for injection was $2.29 per animal. Therefore, it is much more cost effective to use injection as opposed to gas. I would like to talk about other communities are saving, how other communities are saving 80 to 90% of all animals by implementing the no kill equation. While Cabarrus County has a kill rate of over 80%, excuse me, we are not going to solve this with quick fixes here and there. We must implement the no-kill equation to achieve success. I encourage the Cabarrus County government to adopt and implement the Animal Protection Act, a shelter reform law that will bring Cabarrus County Animal Shelter in line with progressive communities around the country. Thank you. Thank you. The next is Mr. Brian Romans or Romains? Romans. Romans. Sorry about that, Mr. Romans. I get it all the time. It's okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Brian Romans. I live at 510 Wiley Avenue in Salisbury, North Carolina. Uh, and I'm, <clears throat> I became involved with Justice for Bella when I first heard what happened to Bella at the hands of Deputy Austin. Uh, let me say initially that what he did was disgusting and cold-blooded. The fact that he was found innocent of wrongdoing doesn't change the reality of the situation. You could give him every medal and award in the world, and it wouldn't change what you and I both know. Cabarrus County has a dirty little secret of the wholesale, cold-blooded murder of companion animals. If not at the hands of the very officers sworn to protect, capturing them, then at the hands of the shelter that is legally bound to find them homes. Family pets are being killed by the thousands in your county on your watch, with your tax money. Cabarrus County Animal Control clearly does not require training in non-lethal me methods of capture for animals. Cabarrus County Animal Control clearly does not require their officers and deputies to understand canine ethology, to understand nonverbal communication between animals, to even understand what animal uh, communication is, the idea of posturing, physical communication. Officer Austin didn't have the first clue what to do with Bella. He simply shot what he didn't understand. Cabarrus County Animal Control still uses gas chamber killing. Gas chamber killing that is a, an antiquated, a dangerous, a disgusting, and an expensive means of disposing of companion animals, family pets. Dogs and cats alike, 
oftentimes in the same box. And if our numbers are right, it's 80 to 90% of the animals that Cabarrus County Animal Control collects. I'm begging you, <laughs> as a citizen of the state, as a citizen of the country, as a concerned uh, pit bull owner, as a concerned dog lover, as someone who's going to school to be a dog trainer, to change what is so clearly broken in your county. You have the opportunity to stand up and make a difference or to be counted as those who were so cowardly and ineffective that you couldn't do anything in face of an answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Romans. Um, next is Mrs. Susan Boyer. Mrs. Boyer. Good evening. My name is Susan Boyer, and I live in Morrisville, North Carolina. Um, I'm here, I guess, as an expert witness of sorts. I do work at Animal Control in Charlotte currently. Um, I am a certified veterinary technician as well as a certified euthanasia by injection EBI technician in Charlotte. Um, I go back to the early 1980s in my career with animal control. I opened the first spay-neuter clinic there as a vet tech. Uh, went from there as a supervisor for Charlotte Mecklenburg Animal Control in charge of many things as well as the euthanasia of animals. In 1981, Charlotte was using a gas chamber. Um, during my time there, yes, I've been there, done it. You know, walk the walk, talk the talk. I've turned that knob, shut that. Well, shut the door, turn the knob. Heard those noises. Okay, it's a noise you will never forget. During that time, one of our directors had the foresight to see she wanted to see euthanasia by injection. I was there during that time when we started to eliminate the chamber use and went to euthanasia by injection. What I personally found was uh, there were only two certified techs out of the five supervisors. We trained those other three supervisors to hit a vein. When they chose on the side to use the chamber, which was still working, the, the technicians and the kennel attendants would come to me and say, you please euthanize today because I know they'll put them in the gas chamber. That told me what it meant to people that work there and how it boosted their morale. They felt better. It's a job we have to do. We know that. I've euthanized not animals by the hundreds or the thousands, but more than 10,000, just me. It's nothing I'm proud of, but I can say with euthanasia by injection, they've all gone out with compassion. Um, I am more concerned with the people that are working at the shelter, frankly. Um, euthanasia by injection is a morale booster. It makes them feel better. Um, at the time when I was there, puppies were $5. They went out the door without any spay neuter, nothing. Uh, Cabarrus, I think, understand, they now send them out like that, hoping that it, people will get them neutered. If they don't, you're only contributing to your own problem. Um, I did take some time off, returned back to work there in 2005 full time to find a new facility. Animals that were being adopted out fully vetted, neutered, and microchipped. Free spay neuter clinics, which were, are run by private funds. Rabies clinics free once a month. Volunteers, over 100 volunteers work at that shelter today. They walk those dogs, they foster the animals, um, they clean for us, they run off-site adoptions. They do what all the employees want to do but don't have time to do. We have to do the dirty work there. Um, I am 100% in agreement. Volunteers can't run a shelter and should not run a shelter, but a shelter runs much better with their volunteers. Um, rescue groups. Charlotte has over 100 rescue groups it works with. I actually am involved in two of those rescue groups. Last year, 2010, the 2010 fiscal year, they pulled over 11% of the animals. Thank you, Mrs. Boyer. Thank you. Next is Mrs. Jessica Juba. I'm Jessica Juba, resident of Concord at 2875 Eagle View Place. Dear commissioners, concerned citizens, and members of the media, two decades ago, the concept of a no-kill community was a little more than a dream. Today, it's a reality in many cities and counties nationwide, and the numbers continue to grow. And the first step is a decision a commitment to reject the kill-oriented failures of the past. No kill starts as an act of will. The next step involves putting in place the infrastructure to save lives. Following a commitment to no kill is the need for accountability. Accountability means having clear definitions, a life-saving plan, and protocols and procedure oriented toward preserving life. But accountability also allows 
and indeed it requires flexibility. Too many shelters lose sight of this principle, staying right with their shelter protocols, believing these are engraved in stone and they are not. Protocols are important because they ensure accountability from the staff. But protocols without flexibility can have the opposite effect, stifling innovation, causing lives to be needlessly lost, and allowing shelter employees who fail to save lives to hide behind a paper trail. The decision to end an animal's life is an extremely serious one and, shouldn't, and should always be treated as such. No matter how many animals a shelter kills, each and every animal is an individual and each deserves individual consideration. And finally, to meet the challenge that no kill entails, shelter leadership needs to get the community excited to energize people for the task at hand by working with people, implementing life-saving programs, and treating each life as a precious life. A shelter can transform a community. The mandatory programs and services include feral cat TNR program, high volume, low volume spay and neuter clinics, rescue groups, foster care, comprehensive adoption programs, pet retention, medical and behavior rehabilitation, public relations, community involvement, volunteers, proactive redemptions, and most importantly, a compassionate director. But it is clear that no kill is simply not achievable without rigorous implementation of each and every one of these programs and services. These programs provide the only model which has ever created a no kill community. Declaring a resolution to become a no-kill community that is committed to reducing shelter intake and saving and adopting out every healthy animal will absolutely energize and excite the community and the media and will be met with an overwhelming positive response as it has in every community that has committed to becoming a no-kill community. Not only that, by forming, directing the shelter to form a community coalition with rescue groups, veterinarians, and volunteers, not only will we immediately begin saving animals overnight, we can access millions of dollars in funding and grants available for such coalitions. Thank you, Mrs. Juba. Thank you. <clears throat> There's been a lot said tonight in regards to um, justice for Bella or reforming the uh, animal control and uh, in talking with Commissioner Carruth on some of these issues regarding the Animal Preservation Protection Committee. Um, we've talked about some things about what can be done. Um, Commissioner Cruz, have you had a chance to pull up anything or, or I know y'all meet later this month. I'm not certain when, but yeah, actually Wednesday evening we'll be meeting mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> a couple of things if I could just share this with the board and also with folks that are here tonight. And first of all, let's say that the passion is, is, is ignited is great because let's put it this way. My wife has gone this weekend to Georgia. And while she was gone to Georgia, I had the responsibility for the miniature poodle that was in February, was in a cage breeding dogs. I had the, I had, you know, I had responsibility when that dog came in from outside of putting the diaper on the dog. And that dog sleeps on her bed every night now. And the dog is living its puppyhood that it's never had. We've got five dogs in our house. So when I'm speaking from up here, and I tell you that we have dogs <laughs> and we've all of them are from rescue situations or litters that just happened to be at the veterinarian's office when we took another dog there and uh sometimes my our sons get a little upset but they they are uh uh i really need down like it that we have the, the our own little pack that runs around in our house so anyway uh i did some in, for the board here i did some kind of some investigation some checking and, and some things and that idea that i actually had brought forth back in February before our committee uh, that I want to talk a bit more about tonight and see if this board agrees to let the committee take a look at this because the committee was formed up back in 2004 uh, in 2005 time frame solely for the purpose of looking at how do we handle overpopulation issues and since then we've had a couple of spay programs that have uh, come out of that uh, as well as our own what we call it, the SNPs program which is a spay neuter uh, indigent program that's available through DSS uh, that, you know, targets the group of population where most of the old population is coming from. Um, anyway, they, um, but we've, I don't think there's anybody up here that disagrees that 80% is not acceptable. We've got to do better. We've got to do better in this community. Uh, and so what I started looking at is what do we do? And I started, did some research on no-kill shelters. And no-kill doesn't mean 
it, no kill, it just means that we were, I mean, it, no euthanasia, it means no kill. That means that if you can categorize every animal that comes into that shelter is, you know, determine the adoptability of that animal. And, and I would say that that should be a group of people uh, that represent a cross section of the community. They're involved in animal rescue to determine which animals would be adoptable, which would not be adoptable. And it said as a goal that those that are adoptable are going to be adopted out and there will not be a euthanasia occur on a single animal that is adoptable or can be rehabilitated or through by going to a specialty type trainer uh, have their behavior changed. Um, but I went back and looked and I've, I've heard Jessica say a moment ago that we had, you know, it's a network of volunteers, network of, of private rescue organizations, network of veterinarians, foster care, all those things I found we have in the community. We have a ton of resources in this community. There's at least half a dozen private rescue groups that are out there in the trenches, week to week basis. They're saving animals. Uh, and the groups may not always agree on exactly how they do it, but the important thing is they probably in this last year, I did not get the exact numbers, but I know there's probably been thousands of animals this last year, dogs and cats that have been adopted in this community, not out of the shelter, but through these private organizations. The, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, but what I'm saying is these private organizations are doing this. Now, the problem is, it is the fact that look back towards the mid-90s and when we, the Humane Society and County developed a partnership, a handshake partnership pretty much because there was never any formal agreement assigned. Uh, the Humane Society uses the animal shelter for free. They, uh, or most a dollar per year in 2006, it was, we finally did a contract that was signed by the county, but the Humane Society never signed the contract. The Humane Society, and I'm, I know some people in the Humane Society may not be happy to hear this, but I, and I'm not pointing fingers at them. I'm saying that what happened was, was that through that, there was this idea developed in the community that if you were not part of the Humane Society, if you were a separate rescue organization, you could not go and freely go and get animals out of the animal shelter. And what I want to do is I want us to, from this board to communicate loud and clear and also from the Animal Protection and, uh, Advisory Committee uh, through a, program we could, a community program we can set up that throw the doors open wide and they, that anyone is, ex, you know, anybody can get an animal out of animal control. Uh, that it's, that it's, that they're not shut off to those people that aren't part of just one particular rescue organization. Um, what I'm going to ask to do from this community, if we could, to I would like for us to do this. I would like to to ask our uh, the Animal Preservation Protection Advisory Committee to look at several things. Uh, one of them is, uh, and I, you know, can't go. I mean, don't, don't we could be here all night, bog down the details because I think the details are still to be worked out in some of this. But the concept is basically this: that if you remember from the staffing study we had done uh, for the sheriff's office, that one thing that came out of that was the idea that there need to be another position in animal control to take care of uh, really a lot of the administrative uh, minutiae that goes on there. Uh, that we do that and we couple that with a, an adoption director. This adoption director would not report to the sheriff. This adoption director would be totally separate. Uh, what this adoption director would do would be responsible for assessing, uh, analyzing the, uh, any animal that is brought into animal control They've established a database and network of all local and regional rescue organizations that within 48 to 72 hours after a dog or a cat hits that shelter, a rescue organization is taking that animal out of the, out of the shelter. Uh, these rescue organizations, of course, they, most of them already have foster care networks where they have people that foster these animals. They have adoption processes set up uh, we can also, if they want to adopt out of the shelter, we can, we can demand that. We can ask that of them, that certain standards be met. Um, the, but the public adoptions then of animals would be performed through these rescue organizations working in partnership with a director, adoptions director at the county shelter. Now that's not saying other, we would not need volunteers at the shelter because if one person is not going to be able, I think, to assess these animals as they come in. They're not going to be able to do what needs to be done as far as checking them for, for heartworm, checking them to make sure that the behavioral wise that they have, they can be rehabilitated. I think it's going to take a network of specialists in that volunteer specialist in the shelter to determine how they can do that. Uh, I think that, you know, that to, 
I think we need to look back, because back in 1992, uh, this board considered, and I believe approved for a short period of time, licensing of pets. Um, I looked at the no-kill programs across the country, and there's not a single, and that's one component of it, is pets are licensed. As responsible pet owners, we all take our dogs and our cats, and we have them vaccinated. And when we do that, that funds the, gives you the funds, provides the funds that, are, that you can use then uh, to fund a community-wide adoption initiative. Uh, but, and then what I would say is, is that this, this community, I would encourage people to get involved in, because what will happen is the private organizations will need people. will need people to help clean cages. They'll need people to help foster uh, animals that, that are up for adoption. Uh, transport. Uh, there's places in the country where they have a shortage of pets, and they would love to have pets in, in, in particular breeds that come from here. Uh, so that's that's what I kind of I'm looking at because what I see this is it is a it's not just a, a animal control issue it's not just a sheriff's issue it's not the board of commissioners issue it's a community issue, and what I want to do is set the network up so that we uh, as a community can address these issues and we can work together uh, to get the you know to, to lower that euthanasia rate and I and I believe that you know from knowing the people on this board I believe that y'all would I believe everybody on this board would support that. Commissioner Monnet. Um, I, I'm, I'm pleased to hear Bob uh, having looked into this so much and I was unaware or had forgotten that you were on that uh, committee and I do hope that you go back to the committee and convince them that this is an issue that we really need to look at thoroughly. I'm going to part with you a little bit okay. on, on your speed. Um, I think that uh, it would be better taken if as a uh, board of Commissioners at our next work session we discuss this a little bit mm -hmm. and talk about how will we go about mm -hmm. approaching this organization your, your committee etc and um, I, part of that um, deliberateness I think would be studying where what has happened in other communities that has been successful mm -hmm. um, here I'm hearing Charlotte I have a a dog in my house right now who came from the Charlotte shelter, and I was very impressed with uh, the s situation there. Um, so I, you know, I think rather than emotionally responding to something and perhaps doing it in in a less than optimal way, should be tempered with looking at how we go about responding to this issue, who we want to have work with us. To, to get get this going. Apparently, other communities have done successful things. Let's find out what those are. Let's see who those people were. How did they get that done? How did they get that started? How are they keeping it on ongoing? And how are they, uh, critically for the commission, how is it funded and paid for? The, the uh, um, Mr. Chairman, for one thing, uh, Grace, I think that, and that's what I mean, not moving me with due haste, but us do de very deliberately. I think that one of the things that Wednesday is talking with the representatives that are on that committee to get their ideas and to, to kind of start to hone this a little bit more. And I think definitely by the time we come back to our work session, have some more information for that. But I think what I'd like the, I call it, uh, the APPC is to help us get under more information about what exactly does a no-kill shelter mean. Okay in looking uh, under doing the brief research that I had is like you said is no kill doesn't mean that every animal mm -hmm. is not from what the research I was looking at is under the PETA website was that no kill doesn't mean no kill what does what can we do to try and accomplish what Mr. Romans was saying is is there a way that all animals can get adopted I don't know mm -hmm. um, but look into what that actually means um, the the concept of the net guns i know that that there's been some looking into that uh there needs to be we need to figure out about that uh, more um the uh, the i need a better understanding about the injections in regards to uh, looking at injections um, the cost that I'm sorry, I think Mrs. Faircloth brought up. Is either Ms. Fair, Fair, yes. Faircloth or Ms. Okay, I think she brought it up. The cost to, uh, but also the safety, not only to the animal, but also to the um, person that's um, given it. Um, and I think that 
I believe that Mr. Romans rep, uh, stated something about uh, canine nathology. Okay, 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> what I, I believe that, uh, that that was used, but I'm not certain. I want to go back and check in on that. But I think that we need to understand that. So I think it's something that the, uh, I would ask that the APPC look into this, get some preliminary information, what can be done, um, what role they can serve to help us. And if that committee is not able to do a lot of this work, I would ask that they consider um, speaking to Mrs. Juba or Mr. Daniels or some of the people that have been speaking to us in the past to help us um, with this information and, w and what can be done. Okay. Um, me, so, they haven't even met since 2008, Mr. White. Mr. Daniels, we listen to you. Please listen to us. But you didn't listen to me because you have the information that you were just speaking Mr. About Daniels, right here. Mr. Daniels, Mr. Daniels, we have listened to you during the informal public comments. If you want to wait until after the meeting, we will talk some more. That is fine. Okay? But we have had a chance, and we listened to you for three minutes and everybody else for the three minutes. We need to move on in regards to other matters and what is on the agenda tonight. If you want to sit around, we can talk some more. Now, um, is there anything else? Just one more thing to add, Mr. Chairman, and this is, uh, and I know because the, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about different things, especially, and I think a lot of it revolves around the use of cham gas chambers versus injection, uh, euthanasia by injection. And uh, the, <laughs> I'm going to say this, and it's, going to be, it's, it's pretty gruesome to hear it, but I think most of you will be aware of it, is that there are some places, and I'm not sure if any place still exists in North Carolina. I know there's one county that in North Carolina had a drive-through drop-off point. You had three shoots. You had one for large dogs, one for small dogs, and one for cats. And what you did, you drove through and you just dropped the animal in the chute if you wanted to give it up. There's places where they have built homemade boxes and they back a truck up and hook up a hose pipe to the exhaust to euthanize the dogs. That does not go on in Cabarrus County. Uh, the chamber here is approved by a veterinarian and the procedures are approved by a veterinarian. We do need to stop those absolute horrible abuses of that system that go on uh, and we have a discussion about it. But there was a thing, Mr. Chairman, uh, I've come across two calls that pronounced it right, the Asla Lamar uh, Accords, Mountain California. Several years ago, California passed a couple of laws regarding shelter operations. And one of those accords, they, the accords they passed uh, that came up was between the various rescue organizations that recognized, first and foremost, their responsibility were to increase and decrease the number of animals that are euthanized and to increase uh, the number of adoptions that occur uh, in a community. And even though they may differ in the way they approach it, they may, they may have some different approaches and different things going on in the way they do their business, they all agreed to work together in a community-wide effort to make sure that animals were rescued and they were saved from the shelter. That's it. And so I think that one thing we ought to consider is, is part of this is looking at those accords in detail and what that says. And that's what would be would establish our expectations for any kind of community-wide program. Uh, that, uh, that way we can all work together towards getting, achieving what we're trying to achieve, and that's a community-wide effort to save these animals. So anyway, that was it. Thanks. Mr. Crutchfield. Ah. Before I get into my issues, uh, I, I support the folks who have been here tonight. I got a lot of cats. I'm just trailer trash, but I, I like animals. That said, uh, I've had a problem with the Concord Police for some time. I've been arrested about 15 times now, and I've never harmed anybody. Uh, the other day, uh, about two weeks ago, I was arrested by the Concord Police, uh, and they charged me with calling them child molesters. They put on there that I was involved in activity that was likely and intended to produce violence by calling them the officers child molesters. Well, the Concord Police called me riotous not too so long ago, and I was found not guilty in court on that deal. So if they can call me riotous in front of my friends and associates, why can't I call them child molesters? You know, over here at Jay Robinson School, we all know what went on over there with the Concord Police. Uh, one of their own was charged with a felony sex crime over there and allowed to make a plea bargain and get out of it. Everybody knows what the deal was there. Now, uh, again, uh, they can call me riotous 
front of my friends and associates and embarrass me and demean me, but I can't call them child molesters. I get arrested. They didn't arrest me then. They waited till the next day, and they sent six cars to my house that the taxpayers had to pay for. Six cars. The chief of police says it was four cars, so it's safe to say it was between four and six cars that the police sent to my house the next day. Wasn't serious enough then to put me under arrest, and I was at the police station, and the complaint was from the police, not a private party. But they didn't arrest me then, but bad enough the next day to take the taxpayer's money and send all these cars to my house. After all, I'm just trailer trash with cats. And uh, I'm very upset about this, and I think it's a ripoff to the taxpayers. I can't argue none of this in court, because we got a court system over there that runs things the way they want to run them. They got their procedure. Skip the rest of it. They got their procedure, not the Constitution and the rest of it. All that stuff doesn't work. But anyway, if you say something about the police, you get thrown in jail. If they say, if they say, say something about you, just as bad, probably worse, they don't go to jail. Having a hard time with it. And uh, I just think it's, it's a ripoff for anybody that, that, that says, oh, you have all this freedom in America. You can say whatever you want. Baloney. If you got money to get out of jail, you can say all you want. It's, I know. Freedom ain't free. I know. If you're trailer trash, you'll pay when you say something about the police. And that they can say anything they want about you and not go to jail, including lies. They lie under oath in court, and uh, they've done it more than once, and uh, everybody knows it. They consume alcoholic beverages on school property. They don't have to pay for that. And uh, it just goes on and on and on. You got a Concord police force that's out of order. And it's my, I'm of the opinion from what I've experienced that they're vile child molesters. Thank you, Mr. Crutchfield. Next matter that we have is the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Next matter we have is appointment to boards and uh, committees. First is the Cabarrus Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, we have a motion to reappoint Mr. Danny Fesperman to the Cabarrus Planning and Zoning Commission to fill the central planning area seat for a three-year term ending August 31st, 2013. So moved. We have a motion, we have a second. 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 All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Now we have a motion to appoint Shannon Fry to the Planning and Zoning Commission to fill the at-large seat vacated by Mr. Prince for a three-year term ending August 31st, 2013. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. We have a motion to appoint Mr. Eugene Devine, uh, to, who is a current alternate to the Cabarrus Planning and Zoning Commission to fill the Harrisburg planning area seat for a three-year term ending August 31st, 2013. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. We have a motion to appoint Mary Blakeney to the Cabarrus Planning and Zoning Commission to complete an unexpired term ending August 31st, 2011 for the at-large alternate seat vacated by Mr. Devine. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. We have a motion to appoint Emily Knudsen or Knudsen to the Cabarrus Planning and Zoning Commission to an at-large alternate for a three-year term ending August 31st, 2013. So moved. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. <coughs> Next matter is uh, H2 is an appointment to the Mount Pleasant Planning Board and Board of Adjustment, ETJ. We have a motion to re reappoint Mr. John Murdoch III, Mr. Whit Moose Jr., and Mrs. Margaret Strickland, alternate. So moved, Mr. Chairman. And that's going to be for three-year terms ending June 30th. 2013, uh, 20, 2013, including the exception for Mr. Murdoch and Mr. Moose for the appointment policy. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion carries. Next is uh, appointment to the Piedmont Area Mental Health, <coughs> Mental Retardation and Substance uh, Abuse Authority. We have a motion to reappoint Mrs. Betty Babb to the Piedmont Area Mental Health, Mental Retardation and Substance Abuse Authority for a four-year term ending June 30th, 2014. So moved. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. And this, the next is H4, appointment to the Public Health Authority of Cabarrus County. 
We have a motion to appoint Mrs. Phillips, Phyllis Wingett Jones to the Public Health Authority of Cabarrus County for a three-year term ending June 30th, 2013, including an exception to the residency provision of the appointment policy. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries. With that, um, I have just, uh, we have not had our first meeting with the Health Alliance. I'm gonna be starting that next month. So I'll report back to the board about any upcoming things. I do know that the Health Alliance was recognized recently for uh, a national award um, and also the idea or the concept of um, going paperless. They're gonna have all their, their reports um, scanned and uh, I think it's the first in the country to do that. Uh, so I think it's very, uh, they're doing a good thing out there with mm -hmm. Dr. Pilkington under his leadership. We do have Harrisburg area land use plan. Uh, there are some reports that are up uh, to police, so please look at those. And we have a meeting, or there is a, uh, I guess a limbo going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is a, uh, a meeting for the Harrisburg area land use plan coming up, uh, I believe it's uh, next week. Um, and as always, mm -hmm. if you're interested in serving, please, consider serving there are some uh, there are many committees and there's boards that are on our website if you'll please go to that you can find them and uh, it may strike up an interest in there with that is there uh, we do have a closed session matter or meeting tonight uh, is there any discussion or any comments from the uh, board seeing none do we have a motion to go into closed session uh, as uh, to consider the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment or conditions of initial appointment of, a, of an individual public officer or employee or prospective public officer or employee as, employee as authorized by North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11. We have a motion to go into closed session. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries, and after that meeting, after that closed session meeting, we will be adjourning. There will be no further business to conduct publicly that I'm aware of. Uh, and at this point in time, we will go into closed session. Thank you. Thank you.